linking the wall to ultra-fast genome sequencing. How the process of genome sequencing was accelerated over a million-fold. Shankar Balasubramanian, University of Cambridge. On November 9, 1989, I was finishing experiments while history was being made. DNA is fundamentally an information molecule. I've spent nearly 30 years now uh, working on trying to understand how it stores information and conveys it. Now, um, DNA has four building blocks, which we often abbreviate to G, C, T, and A. And those building blocks are arranged on a strand of DNA in a particular order. Now, the G base communicates with the C base in the opposite strand and the A base with the T base. And this recognition is the molecular basis for what we call the genetic code and information transfer. In any of your cells, one copy of all the DNA is what we call your genome, and this is about three billion letters. And your genome is made up of segments that we call genes. And these genes carry the code that ultimately is translated into proteins, which are the building blocks and the machines that make life work. There is also the non-coding part of the genome, which happens to be important as well. So one endeavor is to actually determine the order of all these letters in your genome. Now, why would you do this? Well, living systems have genomes, all organisms. So if you want to understand life on a fundamental level, you need to understand the genome of organisms. Now, thinking more about humans, your genome is unique to you, and we all have different genomes. So sequencing your genomes is a basis for understanding what makes us who we are and what makes us different from each other. Third point is um, in your genome lies also the information as to why some people are predisposed to certain diseases. And there are diseases that are caused by um, characteristics in your genome. So finding the cause of diseases. So I'm turning the clock back now um, more than 25 years. This is before some of you were born, but this is where the story begins. Um, I and my colleagues, co-workers, were working in the lab just doing some basic research driven by our curiosity to understand something. So shown behind me is a picture where the, the bottom is just a surface, and depicted is a piece of DNA, which I've called a template, and another piece of DNA, which is the strand being made. And the oval shape is a machine which in nature is used to replicate DNA each time your cell divides. Now, we were observing this using a technique called single molecule spectroscopy, which was relatively new then. And our aim was to simply understand this process because we thought it was important and we wanted to learn using this new technique. One of the ways we were doing this was to incorporate building blocks that were fluorescently labeled. And this machine, it ensures that a G goes opposite a C and a T goes opposite an A as it produces one strand using the other as a template. We were not trying to do anything useful, just trying to understand. <laughs> so shown here is um, my chief collaborator, David Klenerman, who's a physical chemist. And uh, this is a pub, and we are drinking beer. Now, we had many discussions here. This is behind the chemistry department, and there is, a, I think, a much undervalued um, sociological side to, to research and ideas that involves interaction. 
And here we actually, we had an idea to turn this fundamental basic research into a system that, that might do something useful by reading the code of DNA. Now, as we thought about this idea, we could see a way to read DNA much, much faster than the methods of that time. And we visited our friends and colleagues at the Genome Center, who were in the early stages of uh, the Human Genome Project, which was to find the sequence of one representative human genome, which became the reference. Now, this took years, billions of dollars, and our question was, to really understand the genetic basis of what makes us who we are, you have to sequence on a population scale. How are you going to be able to do that? Then we shared with them an idea. I'll give you the essence of the idea. It was to hijack the machines that nature uses to copy one strand and produce a complementary strand. Um, shown here on the top left, there's a single strand, which is a template, and there's another strand that's going to be growing. And by adapting what we were doing, if you could color code each of the four building blocks that go in and use nature's machines called a polymerase to incorporate the correct building block, if you image that, you would image a color and you would decode one of the letters of the DNA strand. Now, by controlling this process, cycle by cycle, you would incorporate a, a chain of different colors. You remove the color after one cycle, you incorporate the next one, you see a different color, and a series of color changes will tell you the code or the sequence of the DNA. Now, Selexa is the name of a startup that we formed to really develop and commercialize this technology in a team. Now, if you can read DNA like that, the reason why it can be faster is you can take the DNA from a cell, you can fragment it into lots of small pieces, you can array these pieces by chemically attaching them to a surface of a chip, and then you can sequence all these fragments in parallel. So by miniaturizing and parallelizing, um, therein lies the potential to sequence millions or even billions of fragments of DNA in parallel at the same time. Now, this is actually um, a real image. of a, an early experiment that sequenced a bacteriophage called Phyx-174. Each of these spots you see is an image of one fragment of DNA that's been amplified, so it's a single sequence, and the colors that you see are the color that tells you about the building block in that particular cycle. So each cycle, the color at a given spot will change according to the letter which is being read. And you can see these spots are about one micron in size. So you can pack a lot of them onto a surface of a chip and sequence at high capacity. OK, so fast forwarding to 2006, the first um, commercialized system that could be democratized to laboratories around the world and it was capable of sequencing one billion bases in one experiment at the push of a button. Then to the right, a more modern system. Now Illumina uh, continued to develop this method. And you can sequence several trillion bases or letters in a single experiment. This translates to effectively uh, a human genome per hour on a single instrument. So the improvement in speed and the reduction in cost is, is over a millionfold um, during the time that elapsed from the start of the project. OK, now going back to the question of why would you sequence 
DNA, why sequence human genomes. I'm going to talk about this in the context of three disease areas. Um, first is cancer. So shown on the left is a very early example of what you can do by knowing the sequence of a cancer. Cancer is caused in large part by changes called mutations to your DNA. So on the left is a common mutation um, found in skin cancers, where one amino acid in a protein called BRAF is altered, and it makes the protein hyperactive. And this drives proliferation. So today, tumors that have this particular mutation are treated with a drug that targets this protein, BRAF. And patients with this mutation are very likely to respond to this therapy. So it's an example of choosing therapy based on the genetics of a specific tumor. Now, projects such as the International Cancer Genome Consortium have sequenced at scale many, many tumors. And these projects are ongoing to really understand more complex genetics of how cancers form and how they evolve. And such information, even today, is being used by clinicians to make treatment decisions. And over the next 10, 20 years, we will know even more. Now, shown also in the middle are examples of population-scale human genome sequencing projects. The one in the middle, Genomics England, is part of the National Health Service in the UK. The pilot project was 100,000 patients in cancer, rare diseases, and infection. Now, rare diseases is a broad term given to diseases that are very difficult to diagnose and seem to be very specialized to few individuals on the planet. One in 17 people has a rare disease. So as a collective, it's quite common. Typically, they are genetic in causation and manifest in early life as a developmental disorder. So projects such as Genomics England have been carrying out work where a child with an undiagnosable disease has their genome sequenced, mum and dad as well, a trio quickly find the mutations that are unique to the child. And in more than 25% of these cases, a diagnosis has been made. Some of these diagnoses are treatable, and others are not yet treatable, but the mechanism causing the disease has been identified. Now, shown on the right, early detection, this relates to cancer, but when cancer cells necrose and die, they spill their DNA into the bloodstream. There are now clinical trials ongoing where taking a blood draw and then sequencing all the DNA that's floating around in your blood is being used to identify changes that inform of a cancer somewhere. And the hope is that this may lead to earlier detection of disease um, which, is, which is much better in terms of treatment and outcome. Now, the third area is infection. We've all experienced the pandemic. So the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus was sequenced in Wuhan early on from a complex sample to identify a new strain. Ultra-rapid sequencing has been used to track over a million cases of infection around the world, and the emergent of, of strains, new strains. <coughs> and this information is being used to survey what's happening and to inform the latest generation of vaccines against the coronavirus. 
Um, so I'm, I'm going to end there with the message that um, basic research and curiosity sometimes leads to unexpected ideas. And if you follow through these ideas, you can make a difference. Thank you.